welcome everyone to Translation Thursdays. It is our 11th session and I'm really grateful to so many of you who have stuck around um, from the first week and I'm also really glad to see a lot of new faces here every week. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Mohini Gupta and I'm uh, doing this as a part of my online poetry initiative called Mother Tongue Twisters uh, where I collect and curate Indian language poetry for young readers. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, we're now on Twitter at uh, MTT and more. So please follow us for more updates. Um, but these weekly translation sessions are really to deepen our own understanding of translation, the process of translation, the joys and the challenges of it. Um, so it's really exciting to have a new speaker and new theme here every week, every Thursday, 7 p.m. Today, as you all know, uh, amongst us, our speaker for the week is a uh, translator, curator and conservationist El Somi Roy. He's speaking to us from Imphal, Manipur. And I'll do a brief introduction of the book that's in focus today, and then I'll hand over to Somi to talk to us um, about his process of translation. So welcome, Somi. Um, Thank you so much. I'm really glad that we could plan this. Uh, I'll do a brief introduction, and then we'll move on to our conversation. Thank you. So for everyone who uh, may not know about the book, The Princess and the Political Agent, um, in 1979, Manipuri writer Binodini won the Sahitya Academy Award for her groundbreaking novel, Boro Sahib Ombi Sanatombi, a work of historical fiction based on the life of her rebellious aunt, Princess Sanatombi of Manipur. It's now been translated as The Princess and the Political Agent by Binodini's son, El Somi Roy, who's here with us today. Uh, and the novel is set in the midst of the British Raj. It tells the love story of Sanatombi and Lieutenant Colonel um, Henry Maxwell the British representative in the subjugated Tibeto-Burman kingdom of Manipur at the time. Pinodhani is known to be the supreme stylist of contemporary Manipuri literature and also is an icon of Manipuri modernism. Somi, who's here today, is the translator, uh, like we said, of Pinodhani's works from the original Manipuri into English. He's also translated other books such as Crimson Rain Clouds and The Maharaja's Household. He is uh, the founder of Imasi, the Maharaj Kumari Binodini Devi Foundation in Imphal. He is also a film curator from New York. He writes on film, theatre, photography for various publications. Um, he is also a promoter of international polo in Manipur and works towards the preservation of the Manipuri pony. So there are many lives that you live, Somi, and I hope you know, we'll only cover one of them today, but feel free to bring all of the other lives into the conversation today as well. So a really warm welcome to you. I'm really happy okay. to find out more about your book, uh, about your mother's book, your translation, and the challenges that you faced while working on this. Um, and today's focus, of course, is on history and memory. And, uh, you know, the book itself is structured as a series of flashbacks. So I was wondering, you know, how do sort of history and memory and fiction come together in the book? And what, you know, how did you see them interacting in this novel? Well, first of all, thank you so much to everyone taking your time this evening to join us. And I think, I don't, I don't, well, I do see an old friend from England. So there are several time zones here. Hello, Emma. And um, so um, I know it's a very tough time for us all uh, across the globe and wherever we are, we are. So please stay well, uh, be well. And uh, I'm glad that we are able to get together online um, to discuss uh, something that uh, is a, a tour de force of literary techniques, really, that she was using. And so it was not simply a historical novel written as a historical romance, but it is actually a book of literature that uses many different literary, literary techniques as well. So there were many challenges that actually, uh, I, that made me wish that I was actually I uh, had my mother sitting by me and say, what did you mean by this? Uh, because when I did, when I worked on editing the first book, we put in little graphic devices. Uh, she did not want chapterizations as such. She used graphic devices uh, of spacings. And she was very profligate with NFCs. And she would like dot, 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 all over the place. And I, being this uh, wise-ass college kid, was like, do we need so many dots? And you know, we would argue about it. And she was like, oh, go ahead and do this. You know? So it was always important to, for me previously to get my mother's permission, the writer's permission, to certain things that I was unsure about. And that was something that I feel that once I was used to that proximity, I felt that I was kind of missing it this time. 
in fact you um, mentioned that already but thank you first of all so much for that because it's a very special relationship that you share with the text and with the writer um, and that intimacy of course must count for a lot uh, and i can imagine that you would hear it in your in her voice and you would sort of you know go back to that at all times so i'm sure that was an extremely uh, intimate process for you uh, but you did mention the graphic devices and the, the different kinds of literary devices that she used, you know, whether it's um, idiosyncratic punctuation or it's spacing and paragraph spacing in particular ways. So how did you sort of think about translating those when you were translating into English? Well, I mean, um, my mother was a very odd writer in many ways because uh, on one hand, she was very strong willed and said, no, I want this. On the other hand, if you say like, you know, this is not really grammatically in, uh, in terms of punctuation correct, she would say like, oh, fix it yourself, I don't care. She was very fond of quoting her uh, dear friend, Lysram Samarendra, who was a poet, uh, who was always uh, drag, uh, uh, pulled up for, for his punctuation in his poetry. And she loved quoting him uh, because he said, go correct it. He would just tell someone, fix it. You know, I've got my poetry. So um, to a certain degree, she was somewhat cavalier about it. You know. On the other hand, if you try to mess with it too much, she was, you know, no, she pulls you up short and says, no, 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 no. I want these dots for this particular reason. Now, some of these ellips elliptical uh, 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 interferences in text uh, that I saw as interferences at, at first um, were actually... Um, upon close reading, literary devices of a graphic nature. And that was very important for me to uh, come to the realization of. Um, and so the, when we, uh, one of the first discussions, important discussions I had with my editors and Penguin was how to deal with this because ellipses are usually at the end of a sentence. It's either three dots, if it's going to continue the sentence or the thought, or four, the fourth dot being a period, the full stop. She uses sometimes three or four of these sets. So we actually made little compromises and said, all right, we'll put them in sets of threes. <laughs> I don't know how much sense that made, but, I, but we wanted to preserve that. And sometimes she uses the ellipses at the beginning of a sentence. And that is really grammatically and in terms of English punctuation, a no-no. And that is something that Fair, until fairly recently, Penguin and I went back and forth like, you know, we really need to do this because this is what the writer intended. And my argument was that I began to realize that these uh, punctuations were actually uh, introducing a somewhat rhythmic breathing of the prose. It was forcing the writer, uh, the reader, to read at a certain pace. When the dot, dot, dot comes, it is indicating a thought a period of silent thought before the next sentence comes in, which is a change of thought. It's a dot, 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 dot. And she said, you know, and I was thinking, you know, so she wanted the reader uh, to proceed with the text at a particular speed uh, with certain pauses. Uh, and that was kind of important, uh, an important function of the way that she was using uh, these periods. The other thing, of course, is that uh, she was a, a student of art in Santiniketan and had studied painting and sculpture. And, uh, and so she was interested in art and she was a very good sculptor herself. Uh, she had studied under Ram Kinker uh, Bej and was actually his uh, muse. You'll see Vinodhani portraits at the National Gallery in Jaipur, for instance, by Ram Kinker. Um, so she was interested in graphic devices on how what the, the what the what the words looked like, what the text looks like on the page. And one of the things that she did was the uh, spacing of paragraphs, and that indicates time shifts, pauses, memories. And there were many devices, many instances when she actually uses double or even triple the spaces between paragraphs. And I, being a fan of people like Peter you know, Lawrence Stern and System Shandy, and also I was intrigued by this, thinking like, wow, here's a graphics device uh, being used by a Manipuri writer, which I had not realized until I actually sat down to translate and I had to decide how many space keys I had to hit on my laptop. 
So that was another thing where we find that she's a very strong-willed writer that enforces a certain uh, uh, a certain speed and a certain way of um, of a of a reader's inner exposition of the text in the, in their heads, and that was something that I found was intriguing, fascinating, and I thought it worked. And my uh, discussion with Penguin is that if if it works, let's keep it working. And Penguin's point was, if that's the case, then in some instances, let's exaggerate it, so that people who are not familiar with some of uh, you know the Mizor work from before, especially not manipulative readers or uh, you know, we need to say that these, this is not a mistake in the typesetting. This is a deliberate spacing and a deliberate break. Um, and so we kind of use that. We also use this in terms of the historical periods, because if we're moving back in periods, and I see some Manipuris uh, here in our group here, uh, I see Dilip Mutum over there and so on. Um, but for people in Manipur, they would know they would be more familiar with the references that go back to different or forward to different time frames. For people who are not that familiar with Manipuri history, and that's the majority, the vast majority of the readership, potential readership of this, of this book, this translation, it was kind of important to uh, kind of make sure that people understand that there's, there is going to be a time shift over here. So the editors at Penguin and I, we also put those in because, you know, we did have to remove some of the, uh, um, graphic devices, the actual drawings that she put in, uh, that we put in at the beginning of each, each chapter. Since we had to remove that as a modern classics edition, we had to we had to somewhat exaggerate the um, graphic devices to make sure that people understand that these are graphic devices and that a time shift is coming and that um, you are asked to uh, you are asked to respond as a reader to different time periods that you're supposed to hold in your head and piece together as you go along. So it's, this is not a simple, straightforward uh, historical novel, but does require what they call reader response uh, to, to the text. That's really fascinating. And you were also saying that, um, you know, she didn't believe in uh, categorizing, you know, different parts of the text as chapters, and it was sort of separated with these, some of these graphic devices, which you had to then convert into chapters. Uh, in the English sort of structure. So that's also a really interesting thing which we never think about when we talk about translation. You can actually show, you can actually show one of the, the sketch of the Kangla Sa for them to see one of the original drawings. So this is one of the original drawings that, uh, that she uses, maybe three or four times uh, during, in, the, in the course of the book as, as almost a chapter that she was using. And I don't know who drew, who drew this. Yeah, I was going to ask you that, actually. So we don't I, know think, I think it's one of my questions by marriage, but I'm not sure. And the other thing that I wanted to also acknowledge was that uh, Vinodhani herself was a translator, right? And she translated uh, from Bangla and actually from other languages as well. Um, from Bangla, I think, primarily. Yeah. I mean, this is the second language that like uh, Bengali. I mean, like she, and this I heard from other Bengalis, by the way, not from her. Although she also said my Bangla is very good. Uh, but uh, she started translating also uh, in use. I think the first translation I, I came across is obviously inspired by her period of leftism when she was in college and she first translated Maxim Gorky. And I, I'm pretty sure, I need to look into documents and archives, but I'm pretty sure she translated it from the Bangla rather than from the English because she was much more comfortable in Bangla than in English. Um, and then in the mid 60s, uh, you know, her marriage broke up in the mid 60s and she went through this period of great emotional turmoil and she felt that she really could not concentrate on writing her own original work. And she, she kind of threw herself into translation in the mid 60s, the mid to late 60s. And she translated primarily um, writers that she loved. Uh, one was uh, Shankar, Mani Shankar Mukherjee uh, of, uh, of Bengali literature and uh, uh, Koto Ajanare, if I forgive my Bangla pronunciation, um, which she translated, uh, which she used to read to us to, um, in the evenings after she translated every chapter, because as you know, the book is somewhat episodic about this criminal lawyer in, uh, in Calcutta handling these cases. 
Um, and she also was very fond of um, the dramatist uh, um, Badal Sarkar. So she translated her, his plays as well. And she was part of a group of arts uh, artists, both singers and actors and composers and so on. And so they actually they presented uh, the Badal Sarkar's plays in Manipuri in, uh, in Imphal. Yeah, yeah, there's just there's so much to talk about, but I'm going to sort of bring back the conversation to translation. And uh, we talked about languages. And I think um, it's also important to uh, talk about how you not just translated from one language, but there were almost six different languages or dialects that you were dealing with in the original. So, you know, you mentioned that there was Manipuri Hindi, there was Pidgin Manipuri, there was some, uh, you know, even in terms of poetry, there were some old um, Manipuri poetry meters that you had to translate. So, you know, one is how to translate different dialects and languages into one standard English. And what did you do with those? Is there any sort of, is there any way that you were differentiating between those in the translation? Um, and second thing is poetry. And we can come to that after we discuss language. And I think uh, maybe if you could even talk, just give us a little bit of context also about the Manipuri language itself. And you call it Manipuri, which is a choice as opposed to calling it um, Mite or how, how do you pronounce? Mite Ilam. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the politics of that as well? But we'll, we'll make it quick because there are some questions on chat here and I do want to get to them. Um, so we can sort of try to, you know, shorten this discussion and then move on to questions. Your voice is a bit unclear, so me if you could... Of the, uh, <laughs> There's some kind of disturbance coming here. Um, of the uh, four Indian language groups, uh, uh, language groups in India, families in India, Indo-European, Dravidian, Austro-Asiatic, and Tibeto-Burman, Manipuri is one of the Tibeto-Burman languages. I call it Manipuri mainly as an exonym because it is called Manipuri in the uh, eighth schedule of the Indian constitution. It seems to have new usage. But the correct term, which is also an endonym among ourselves, is Maitilo the language of the Maitis. In that way, Man Manipuri is also known as Maitilon in the same way that Manipuri people are also known as Maitis. But one has to realize that there are many other communities in Manipur besides the Maitis. And so sometimes when we, when we kind of uh, conflate everything into Manipuri, it just kind of ignores some of the other Tibetan languages uh, of the different tribes, for instance, um, that are the smaller tribes, because the Maitis are the dominant community over here. So it's a little unfair to actually call it Manipuri because it kind of uh, flattens them all out and obscures their existence. And, and that's, uh, that's something that probably should be avoided. Um, but the, the, the translation uh, is primarily from Manipuri, uh, modern Manipuri, contemporary Manipuri, or Maitilon as we call it today. Uh, but the importance of the other languages is that those language uh, that she introduces, which, whether, which is bits of Hindi, bits of Bengali, uh, uh, bits of Sanskrit, uh, a bit of uh, what is called Aribalon, uh, the, the archaic, older, ancient form of Manipuri. For instance, a very... Your voice has become quite soft again. Is it okay? Yes. Uh, those are very important because they are, uh, they, they are part of the character development and the narrative of, of the, uh, of, in the, in the novel. Like when uh, Maxwell doesn't understand something, he's always referring to his uh, translator, his interpreter, um, who's a Bengali fella. And then he, they kind of, and he replies in some form of Manipuri that is, that we know that he indicates a somewhat broken Manipuri or Bangla inflected Manipuri. And it's kind of important to the character of Maxwell and the character of the, uh, of, of the Bengali clock. Because, and so it was important for me to kind of make sure that, that those uh, little uh, stumbles in language in Manipuri, uh, those little grammatical errors and so on, are indicated without, without it becoming a real problem for the, for the reader's general flow uh, of the of, of of reading the uh, the, the novel, uh, the old Manipuri itself is uh, much more of a challenge because most people here don't know this language anymore. Um, it's really the language of the texts, and these are the languages that this is the language in which uh, 
we, we find a mixture of modern and archaic Manipurian use even today, but it's, the archaic part is usually in song or in, or in, uh, or in literature, and especially in the, ball uh, the ballads that she quotes as part of the character of this uh, 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 attendant character called Not Guilty. Um, uh, his songs that, that he sings are in the original, these are the original uh, oral ballads that were also written down uh, in text later on. And those are the biggest challenges. And I really had to consult two or, two or three different people. My friend, uh, Chanam K. Hem Hemchandra, who's a scholar of, uh, of, uh, of manuscripts, and a, or an, and a balladeer, Anang Sana, uh, uh, who's a balladeer and knows all the songs. And so, we, so translating those uh, was actually a bigger challenge than the existing challenge of tra translating poetry. As you know, po Poetry is what is lost in translation, as they say, right? So in addition to the difficulty of, challenge, of writing, of translating poetry or lyric poetry, I was actually having to deal with Ari Balon as well. And that was a, uh, that was a kind of a interesting part, shall we say. Would you maybe be able to give us uh, an example of uh, one of the poems that you translated? Because I think that would be really nice for everyone here. Um, to listen to the original and your translation as well. So, me, I think you've, uh, I think you may have gotten disconnected. Are you here? Hello. Sorry, uh, you broke up a little bit. What? Did you yeah, you came back. For a bit, and now you're gone again. Okay. You could maybe try to switch off your video, um, and we could at least hear you. Hello. Uh, We're not able to hear you, so your voice is breaking up quite a bit. Can you hear us? Okay, I think unfortunately, Somi's network is acting up. Um, we'll give it another minute to see if he comes back. Sorry, there have been so many technical glitches today. We tried to go live on Facebook as well, and it just didn't happen. Um, but I've posted the Zoom link on Facebook in case there's anybody you know who's trying to join. Uh, I think Somi has dropped off, but he should be back. He did mention that his connection was poor. I also see some excellent questions here. Thank you so much, Girdhar, Ashak, and Marcia. I hope to get to them. If anybody would like to make a comment or say something, please feel free. It's an open forum. In the meantime, I'll try to call Sumi and check if he's able to log in. Okay, I think he's back now. Yes, he's back. Example, an example of what? Yes, Kildhar, thank you <laughs> for acknowledging that. Hi, Somi, you're back. I'm back. Sorry, guys. No problem. We can't see you, but we can hear you clearly. So that's all right. Can you see me now? There we go. So you wanted an example. Yes, please. And we, we would really like to hear the original as well, because it'll be nice to get, um, just okay. to hear the language as well. All right, I'm going to read the original first. No, actually, let, let me read the English first, and then you'll know what I'm going to be reading. Um, I can just scroll. Okay. This is from chapter 19 
Uh, I don't have the ebook in front of me. I'm reading from my original uh, translation doc. Uh, it says, this is the time when uh, Maxwell and Sanatombi are living together in the British residency that he had built, uh, which is now currently the Raj Bhavan of Manipur, by the way. So this is a happy times. And uh, Not Guilty is an attendant, a very fair person, uh, who is a ne'er-do-well, uh, but he's a charming guy, very well-meant person, um, but, um, but was always creating problems and was uh, a person that Sanat Thumbi and Max were very amused by. <clears throat> and he had started living with them as their attendant, as their uh, uh, valet. So this goes. Sometimes Maxwell would take Sanat Thumbi to dinner at other foreigners' homes in Manipur. Sanatombi would wear a bright red sarong and a stole of raw silk embroidered in gold and come out sashaying in front of Maxwell. Not guilty would sing giddily as they walked by. Come, my lovely, come, let us go. Many desire you, many covet you. Come, come walk in front of me. But they were never angry with not guilty, but listened laughing and said, he has an ex excellent voice. So this portion uh, in, the, um, uh, in the original Manipuri would go something like this. Kari gumba dana maxful na sanato bi puraga kana gumba atopa Manipur gi piringi gi yumda dinner java chatli. Sanatam bina chukhi mairi phaine ksetuna sana phige ina phi induna maxul gi maang thaduna thek thek thore e. Landriba angaubana thaduna sa'awi sabi lao lao chatsi lao kalakpaya mi kanjabaya mi maang da tharo lao. So this is a very well-known and popular ballad. Were you able to hear me? Yes, perfectly well actually. Thank you. No, that was wonderful. I'm really glad you read that out for us. In fact, um, I'm going to sort of um, take the liberty to, of asking you to even read out the nonsense poem that you've translated. Because I think that's really fascinating. And then we, ha we must, must get to the questions. Uh, okay, that very, very, quick, very quickly then. Yes. Um, the uh, nonsense poetry, uh, my mother uh, wrote about the dinner party for the Viceroy's visit uh, when Lansdowne came to Manipur. And um, the king, young Jirachan, as a teenager, a teen, teenager said, oh, you must have the Kabul choir to entertain the Viceroy. And Sanatabi wasn't very sure. Maxwell was very worried. Who is this Kabul choir? And the Kabul choir was a group of ne'er-do-well wastrels in this Laikai called Yai School, where I'm sitting right now. Very talented people, full of nonsense, who did nothing but sing and play and dance all day long. So this... Max, so the chapter goes, in chapter 20, 20. Maxwell asked closely about the Kabul choir and said to Sanatomi, you go to the palace first and take a look at it. It will be the end of me if it turns out to be a joke. I don't know what it is. Little Majesty Churachar arranged for an audition for the Kabul choir at the palace one day. Sanatomi also came to watch. About 30 men started the music on the lawn. At first, Two men made sounds like bugles. Now the Kabul choir is a fake choir um, of, people, of Manipuris dressed up as Afghans. They were wearing pointy hats and little Afghan waistcoats. And they sang uh, and they performed and sang these songs that were, uh, uh, which I translate as, as this, which actually nonsense poetry that actually sounds like it makes sense, but it actually doesn't. So about 30 men started the music on the lawn at first, Two men made sounds like bugles. Nabon kaibong do nothing. Clang, clang, petre, petre. Pinau, pinau, little, little. Clang, clang, napui, clang. And then the choir came out accompanied by the beating of two drums and they sang, Jhangi is playing. Play the Jhangi for Allah panaro, yo ya naro. After the choir was lined up, they launched into another song. Touch Mr. Not, touch money not. Jumping spear, jumping spear. This is the 
And then how Sanatomi laughed that day, she had to be helped out. She laughed and she had to wipe away her tears, but she consented. Fine, let's have it. Add a part of it just for fun. So this choir, uh, which was in Yai school where uh, Binodini lived um, and was also the homestead of her mother, uh, produced all these uh, very talented but very uh, eccentric musicians. And so the portion I read to you uh, which in Manipuri is, Maxwana Kabul Pala Gimadam the Munna Hangjili, Aduga Sanata be the high. Nanko num Salaga Hana Yemo, Hayang Pagi Taduna Tokla Badi Loire, Aikari no Kangdi. No man in Tenchura Chana, Sinduna, Konum the Kabul Pala Kauraga, Chang Yang Taure. Sanata be su lacked on a Yang Lay, Isai Haure, Lampakta, Nupakuntramukna. A hand with the Bengal Makol Mana Tukna. Nupa anina kungla i. Nabon kaibon kaibo nai jang jang petre petre pinau nau nau jang jang napui jang. Adudagi pung ani yeraga pala lento i isaitara i. Jangi kela he kela he jangi ala bika pana ro yo ya naro. Pala sindok laba tunga isai anoba lautare i. Babu na sokte, lan sokte, chong lakata, chong lakata. Madudagi, Madugi numita, Sanato, mira no pasi de kari haribano, chinkatpa namdi, mapi, tapa kai noki, adubuma yare, pare, no I never matik ama oina, tolomasu, tolomasu. So that was amazing. Thank you so much. And I also love that you, you left some of the original sounds in your translation as well, which was very which was really well done. I'm really glad that. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Somi. That was excellent. I'm really glad we got a chance to hear you read uh, in both languages. And uh, you've done such an incredible job, um, you know, dealing with so many different kind of translation challenges. Sounds like there were many, many things for you to navigate. Uh, also yeah. thinking about the audience, thinking about how to, you know, what kind of audience would you be translating? And for all of those things, I guess, come into the decisions that you make while translating as well. Um, so it's really incredible. I've, I've learned a lot and I've, you know, it's been a very rich sort of discussion hearing you talk about this. Um, I do want to move on to questions because, you know, we're almost at eight o'clock and there are quite a few questions. So let's see if we can, you know, if you don't mind extending by another 15, 20 minutes, um, we can get to some of the questions. Giridhar, uh, would you like to switch on your video and ask your question, please? Kirithar is here. Okay, he says to ask on his behalf. Um, so the, his question is, were conversations with your mother bilingual? And if so, were some matters in English and others in Manipuri for meeting? No, my conversations with my mother were in Manipuri. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I thought you were going to say something, <laughs> something after that. Thank you. Um, Ashak's question. Ashak, are you here? Would you like to ask the question directly? Okay. Um, so can you please talk more about memory and history? Whereas memory is repetitive and non-cohesive, history is not. How did you negotiate this balance between memory and history? And uh, when a text deals with memories, there's bound to be repetition there. So did you retain those repetitions in your translation? The navigation between memory and history was actually done by the writer, not by me. So I really didn't have to do the heavy lifting on that score. Um, my mother's last book, Maharaja's Household, was indeed about memory, the act of memory and the recalling of memory. And for her, memory was an act of creation. It is an artistic act. It is not something that is uh, uh, unmovable, uh, is immutable. It is something that can be recalled, can be repetitive. In fact, she uses repetition in her other, uh, the book of essays about memory, where memory itself, the literary device of memory, becomes a subject of the essays themselves, ultimately. In this particular 
uh, book, the memory that she uses are the, are the stories that she heard, the, the nursery rhymes that was recited about Sanatobi being a fallen bad woman, for instance, by kids when she was growing up, the stories that her mother, who actually saw Sanatobi and, and had come to inspect her one day when she found out that Jurachan has, has been dating this girl, for instance, those are the memories that she delves into. And then, uh, and then of course, the historical text she was using primarily as the text, the Chaitaral Kumbaba, which is the court chronicle, chronicle of Manipur. But from these two, it is a free for all after that in terms of literature. She just went ahead and, and put her things together. In fact, one of the things that she, quotations that she loved was her friend Vijay Tendulkar had said to her that writing was a process where you almost have a quiver of memories and words and actions and events that you kind of choose it's like an arsenal that you carry on your back and you choose and you fit them together in some other way. And she loved quoting that, saying that actually what I do is basically heard from somewhere, read somewhere or told to me it somehow. So, but the melting of this was actually done by her. It was her art form, this creation of a, of a novel based on history and memory. Uh, and she gives examples. There's one line in, the, in one chapter where he says, um, Maxwell uh, wanted to build a house or something like that. And then, and then, the, then she kind of creates an entire chapter on Maxwell going and building a house somewhere. And then she found out later that some of her literary imaginations were actually also borne out by other literary uh, document sources. So there's an interplay between memory and history and, and literature, with literature always, the literary art form always taking the uh, lead. I don't know if that answers the question, Ashwin. I think that was a great answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Marcia has two questions. Would you like to ask? Directly. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you both Mohini and Mr. Roy for this wonderful discussion. My for, first question is, I want to know about your process. Do you read the entire book first or uh, do you read the text as you go along? Not only about this particular book, about your style in general. And uh, do you want me to ask the second question as well now? Yes. Sure. Okay. And uh, I've, I've find your mother's use of uh, punctuation fascinating. Actually, I'm working on Jivanando Dash right now. So uh -huh. he used a lot of dashes in his poetry and different translators handled it in different ways. Like Clinton B. Shelley, he smoothed it out. He didn't use the dashes, but then Fokrul Alam, he's a uh, um, Bangladeshi translator, he brought in all those punctuation because it was a, it meant something and Jionando himself said that he, he wanted the dashes in his translation. So I want to know, did you know beforehand that uh, you were going to handle this punctuation uh, or uh, you just, um, it just came to you as you started working? I'll wait to take your second question first. Uh, thank you for the question, Marzia. Lovely to have you here. Um, yeah, I was, I'm, curious, I'm interested uh, because I think uh, my friend... Uh, so your voice has gone a bit off again. Uh, uh, poetry also was uh, uh, translated by Chidananda Das Gupta also, I think, was a friend of mine, the film critic. Um, I knew very well that this, the punctuation was going to be something I would have to deal with because I had dealt with it in the first edition of the first Manipuri edition. I read the Manipuri book way back uh, in my youth, in my, in my college days when it came out, and I didn't read it again until this time. This time when I read it, I read it with the view of translating it. And for this purpose, because I needed to revisit all the time, and I didn't want to kind of swing my head real from the book to the screen to the computer, um, I actually took the advantage, and this has become, become my modus operandus now, is that I have someone read it out to me in Manipuri, because even though I read Manipuri, it's not really my language of comfort. It's not something I can just read very uh, fluent. I can read it fluently, but not easily. I just can't sit and read like three hours at a stretch, and I can read a novel in English, for instance. 
So, uh, because I, I, I do my translations very, I revise them so often um, that I actually have someone read it to me and I transliterate it into, uh, into Roman so that I have it for easy reference so that it's both on my, uh, uh, both versions are on my laptop in the same, uh, in the same uh, document. What I was reading out to you earlier of the nonsense poetry and its English version, for instance, is one file. In, in word doc and I put the Manipuri at the bottom and Roman and then, and then I when I translate it I, I put the English on the top and if I need to I just go back and forth rather than going sideways from a book to a laptop it's just the kind of preferred way of doing it for me uh, it would be quicker for me also uh, to find a word for instance my visual recognition of a book of a word in text is actually swifter in English than in Manipuri, for instance, because it's in Bangla script that I read. Um, I studied Bengali also in school because I went to school in Darjeeling. So, uh, so I have that little advantage of having been with Bengali for most of my youth. So that translation uh, process uh, is something that uh, I've been working with, knowing fully well that I've been dealing with the um, with the dots and dashes. Here, my mother also used a lot, a lot of dashes, by the way. Um, and we also had to find a way to make that um, systematic, really, to show that this is a quotation of someone talking, this is someone's thought, and that's where the editors of Penguin and I, we kind of came up with a system to say, when do we use inverted commas? When do we use single inverted commas? When do we, when do we use a colon? When do we use a dash? When do we use the ellipses? How many do we use? How many do we end with? These are all things that we discussed at great length. Um, and what was the first question? Have I answered both or what, Marzo? It was about um, reading the book before or sort of reading as you go along while translating. Oh, yes. Um, since I'd read the book before, um, I just kind of went, dove in straight into the translation. And if I needed to read it, uh, I kind of uh, went into it. But once I'd started it, I realized now the importance of your question because the shape of the book after I got into the meat of the translation began to take shape. I'm not sure if I would have understood it quite as well if I just sat down and read the book at one stretch, like we do with most books, but having gone through sentence by sentence and decon basically deconstructing everything as we go along and then putting it back together, I began to realize that there's a certain shape to the novel which I might have gotten a different sense of if I had sat down and read the book from cover to cover again before I started it. I could have gone either way, I guess. Deepika has a great question as well. Deepika, you Thank here? you. Thank you, Marzia. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, clear. Um, you know, I'm moving away from the literary to the historical, being uh, fond of history, and I was very intrigued by the links of Manipur with Vrindavan, especially with Sanatombi sort of saying, um, you know, referring to a grove in Vrindavan. So I was wondering whether you could um, give us some more details about the link between Manipur and Vrindavan. And also, um, in the book, it was mentioned that her father was cremated in Vrindavan. Was it the actual Vrindavan in Uttar Pradesh or was that another grove elsewhere? Since he died in Calcutta, so I was just one curious. The, um, the ties to Vrindavan are very, very important even today. Uh, Manipur is a Vaishnav kingdom. Right. And as of the late 18th century, the king of Manipur says, I only rule in the name of Lord, Lord Govinda. So it is almost a theocracy. And uh, in that uh, formal way, of course, it is much more temporal and material as a real Raja would rule. Uh, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, who, was, uh, who lived 500 years ago, uh, 500 and maybe four or five years, uh, very coeval with Martin Luther, by the way, in Germany, uh, uh, coming to the same kind of de decisions about the makers of uh, 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 virtue and heaven and all that in the priests and the monks. Um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, with his emphasis on, um, on performance, on song, using of kirtan, this is, the, this is the form of Hinduism that actually took root in Manipur rather than earlier incursions of Shaivism and, uh, and Ramandi. Uh, 
There is only one Ram temple in Manipur right now. We, in my neighborhood, I have three surrounding me. You know, there must be about 150 temples here in Nepal um, of, of Vaishnava, of Radha and Krishna. And we have a form of Vaishnavism that is uh, from uh, Nabadip, where uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu preached. And of course, his birthplace was in Mayapur, across the river, where the international, uh, where the Hare Krishnas have their international headquarters. And because of his uh, pilgrimage, his uh, on foot from Puri to Vrindavan, and his uh, later uh, religious uh, preaching in Vrindavan, Vrindavan is a very important part. Our family still owns various groves there. Many princes still live there. Their descendants still live there. Uh, after uh, one after uh, one year after uh, uh, the death of a person, relatives still take their uh, ashes or, or, or the uh, the frontal bone uh, to either Vrindavan or to Nabadip. So Nabadip being where uh, Mahaprabhu Chaitanya came from, uh, and Mahaprabhu Chaitanya's idol is actually placed besides Radha and Krishna in Manipuri temples, most of them. You know, so Puri is another place we call it Ketra. Of Jagabandhu, uh, and but Vrindavan is where we have a lot of the uh, uh, people who've moved there for you know just to renounce the world in the fourth stage of the life, or to escape horrible family, or abusive husbands, or uncaring children, or basically just saying that I want to devote myself to this. So Vrindavan is a the real Vrindavan is very important. Surchandra died in Calcutta, and then his body was taken to Vrindavan because we have the Radha Kunda and we have the Sham Kunda over there, and those are the. Uh, and we have nursing himself, uh, Turachan's uh, great grandfather has a grove even still today. Um, the previous Gambir Singh also had a grove. So every Manipuri king, they had like, I don't know, must be a, at least a half a dozen major groves with temples being worshipped by Manipuri devotees of, uh, of uh, Lord Vishnu over there. Thank you, Somi, and thanks, Deepika, for bringing that connection up. Um, there's a question from Dan Dananjan. Is he here? or I'll ask the question otherwise. The question says, as memory is a major literary device in the book, there must have been parts that could not have been or were difficult to articulate and manifest in a different language or would have had more of an anemoic effect rather than a memory within the world of the translated language. Did you come across this often in the book? And if you did, how did you deal with translating the original effect? I'm afraid you'll, I'll have to ask you to reread that for me. Sorry, let me read yeah, that. Sorry. Hi. Um, yes. uh, can you hear me? Ah, there yes. you are. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sorry. sorry. Uh, I was a little nervous, so it got a little too convoluted. Um, I wanted to know, um, because, uh, well, translating from one language to a different language, I can understand, could, can be, um, like, we don't have the same words in English as we do in a lot of our native languages as well. And, um, especially when we are recollecting memory. And you said that when your mother was writing, um, she wanted to, that she wanted to use a certain unique voice to carry memory as a literary device. And to do that, um, um, and how, how were you able to um, and translate the the effect that she used and without changing the voice too much or without um changing the effect that it that it provided on the audience on on the reader um but was it difficult or was it um something that came to you naturally because um it it is something that you are close to this piece of writing and the author herself I mean, I would like to say that it came to me easily, and, and certainly I did have my, uh, uh, I paid my dues early as a young uh, teenager, so, you know, I've been translating her work, so then, of course, being family and all that, you know, we hear each other's all the time, and she was a very good storyteller, and very good conversationalist, by the way, loved to tell stories all the time, so all these stories that were in Sanatana, we actually kind of heard before in, in our family uh, gatherings or just hanging out. But it is very difficult. You know, once you actually begin to put the words on the page, it is an extremely difficult thing. And I know that the, this translation is nothing compared to the 
the, uh, the flavor, the character, the humor, the choice of words uh, that, the, that the writer used herself. Um, you know, today there was an article and I said, you know, uh, uh, it was a Borges quote saying that the, ori the, the original always betrays the translator. That was what Borges said. And it's like, you know, every translation is a betrayal and we're moving away from it. Um, and, it and especially when you have a language that's Tibeto-Burman that is so distant from English, in, which belongs to another language family, it's not as if you're translating from French to English or from Spanish to French, which are somewhat closer from the same language group. But, so Manipuri, there are concepts of in, in Manipuri that, uh, that are difficult. Uh, to translate. For instance, in this last thing that I read to you with the balladeer uh, uh, singing after Maxwell takes Sanatambi out to dinner, you know, I had to use the word sachet. Sanatambi sachets out in front of Maxwell and he follows her. She's dressed up prettily and he's proud of his, his wife, is taking her to another European British man's dinner, uh, house for dinner. And the, and the Pina Balladeer is singing, teasing her to him and her, saying, look, look at you, look at the way you're following. This is like what the ballads say. But, but one, what, money, what uh, Binodini uses, take a take. She uses the word take a take. I mean, I don't, there was, there's, and Sashi is too much America's next top model, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's too much of a runway uh, thing. But take a take means when a woman is walking uh, with, with a little bit of an extra exaggeration, knowing that she is very beautiful. She's, it's a very self conscious walk that comes when she feels sexy, when she feels beautiful. And that's something that now she wants to be looked at, she wants to be admired. These are all the connotations the, of, of the, this term, uh, take a take. Uh, uh, Take, take a take mantaki. And there's also alliteration there as well, you know? Uh, so these are some of the things that we are losing in translation. I've tried to do, do some alliteration myself just to show that there is this, uh, that literary uh, device at work and, and so on. But there are certain, you know, because every language is a look, is a separate window into the world of reality outside, there are ways in which, which Manipuris look at the world, which is different from other civilizations. It's a very small civilization, but nonetheless, it's a separate and distinct civilization. And so the words, the framings, the values that they use, even, I, uh, even the flowers that are being described, the choice of flowers being described are, are very particular to this. And it's very, when I just translate it as a flower or give the botanical name or an English name, it, it actually loses the significance of the flower. It's like what a rose would be in English literature or a lily in French, you know? So when we, when we talk about uh, takhele, for instance, when a Manipuri reader reads takhele, oh, the images, the, the fragrance it, it evokes uh, is, is lost when I just say a spiked ginger lily. That means nothing. So informational, but it loses the cultural flavor and connotation. So yeah, it's, it's not... I had a good time doing it, but, but I know that one day I hope a better translation will come along to me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks Thank for the wonderful you. question. And I really enjoyed those examples, Somi, of the thika thik and the, there's a lot of onomatopoeia, there's a lot of sound repetition, alliteration, a lot of those devices, which are, of course, always difficult to bring into another language. But I think, uh, yeah, you do sort of try to bring them into different ways um, into your translation as well, which is quite commendable. Um, there is a question from Tanu and then Dilip has sort of built on it. So I'll just read them out for the sake of, you know, being a bit quicker. Uh, Tanu says, did you at any point feel that there were certain things that were intentionally not being touched upon or left out? And Dilip says, a lot of people see the book as history in the absence of popular books on Manipuri history. However, I realize that it's emphasized as a book of fiction. So are there any examples of fiction or other parts that were not covered in the book? Well, you know, that's really a question better uh, aimed at a uh, uh, professor of literature. Um, yes, there are parts that are being left out. There are parts where things are conflated. There are parts where things are separated a little bit. Um, that's the writer's prerogative. Uh, I know there are certain stories about Sanatombi in our family folklore that is not in the book for dramatic reasons 
for because it would have taken I can see now it would have taken the narrative to another direction. The writer makes those choices. It's a selective choice. It is something that uh, since she's, she's not trying to be um, faithful uh, completely to historical facts as she knows it, and some of which are memory, for instance, we have family memories about Sanatobi and Maxwell that are not in this book, for instance. And uh, I'm quite aware of that, but that is the writer's choice and she made that choice. And I can see that it was made in the choice, the choices were made in the interest of a literary form. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Great questions, guys. Thank you. Yes, the questions are absolutely excellent as always. And I can see a lot of new names popping up here, which I'm really happy to see. Um, we'll end up, we'll wrap up with the last question by Vanisha and she says, do you also translate from English to Manipuri? And if so, how is it different from the other way around? Um, no, I only translate from Manipuri to English. And one of the reasons I took so long in doing this book, apart from the fact that I was kind of intimidated by it and, and I, I had other things to do in my life and I was moving away from this country and so on, is that I always kind of believed in the rule of thumb that you should be translating into your language, not out. Um, and so someone like me should really, who knows English, should really be translating it into Manipuri. But, you know, I left uh, Manipur, uh, and I, have, I have never really lived full time uh, since the age of eight because I went to a boarding school, I went to college, I went abroad and so on. So my English is actually, I'm more comfortable in English than in Manipur, even though I, even though I can make talk, I can make public lectures in Manipuri and I can, you know, I can read Manipuri, etc. To, to actually write a book in Manipuri, because I think I, it's something that I feel, uh, guys, I mean, I'm sure if, how many of you will agree with me, but a book of translation has to stand on its own. At some point, uh, you know, the reference to the original uh, sometimes gets lost. Sometimes I've read a book, I was just thinking of Stanley Elkin's uh, book that I picked up without the cover one day on a beach and I read it without even... I think Stanley Elkin is dropping out. Somi, you dropped off in between. Are you still here? I think Somi's connection has dropped. We were almost there. We were almost at the end. <laughs> but Somi, we can't hear you. And your screen is frozen, but I'm glad that we managed to get through all of the questions. Mm, I'll wait for another minute. If Somi is able to come back, that's wonderful. Otherwise we can wrap up the session. Well, in the meantime, I'm just going to say thank you so much to all of you for sticking through the session today. We had a lot of technical glitches. And, uh, you know, despite that, I think we had a wonderful session and a great discussion with Somi. He's uh, so knowledgeable and he's so sort of articulate about um, his translation process. And just he's so sort of familiar with the text and the culture that it really does uh, make for a very rich discussion. Um, so thank you so much again for all the excellent questions. We do have some um, really good sessions coming up. Next Thursday, we have Ellen Harp Griffith Jones, um, a translator professor. She's here at the discussion right now as well. Um, so she'll be speaking about translating um, from European minority languages next Thursday at 7 p.m. I'll be posting the link on my page, Mother Tongue Twisters, on Facebook and Instagram. So please keep following us if you don't already. Um, and I hope you enjoyed today's session. Really glad that we could, you know, manage to get so much. Um, we had sort of were able to discuss so much. And please feel free to drop in your comments or anything at all, suggestions, comments. Thank you again for being here. And sorry, um, Vanisha, that your question got sort of <laughs> the answer got dropped off in between. But I hope I hope we did gain something from it as well. I'm not sure. I think Somi is not able to come back into the session. 
So maybe we can just wrap up in that case. Thank you, everyone. Have a really good evening. And thank you for spending the evening with us. I hope you join us next Thursday as well. Promises to be a very exciting session. <laughs>